because she does. Yeah. Um, so just for me to finish up, um, for those of you who are getting your newsletters, please read them. They will tell you all of the things to come to and participate. What I do want to tell you is that on August 4th, on Sunday, we will be having a next book fair. Our book fairs are fabulous. It's a Sunday from one to four. And so um, join us and um, come and and you know get some, some books. And uh, people still read in books, which is really nice because we have amazing attendance. So August 4th, please keep that um, on your schedule. And um, for tonight's movie, we can all sort of relate to the, the the schedule this poor lady had to have, even without the the you know the, the things that get in her way. It's just a crazy life. So I guess it's a global thing because it's not just here; it's France and it's everywhere else. So, Shelley, it's up to you. Thank you so much for being with us. We are so grateful that you put us on your schedule because I know how busy you are and um, tell us all about full time. Thank you, Marilyn. And thank you everybody for coming this evening. Uh, yes, the film full time uh, in French, a uh, planton, uh, which translates the same way. It's a very recent film came out in 2021 in France. Uh, the director's name is Eric Gravel. The film won at the Venice Film Festival, won a, a whole bunch of awards, but at the Venice Film Festival, it won for Best Director, Best Actress. France won Best Editing, Best Original Music, and the actress was also awarded uh, Best Actress. Uh, I'll tell you more about her later. Uh, but Eric Ravel is a young director. This was his second feature uh, and quite an accomplished film. His first film, just to let you know where he's coming from, was entitled Crash Test Dummy. Uh, and it was a very well-received comedy about the globalization of work. So it relates to this film in a way. Uh, and the film was about a person who was a, 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 test, a crash test dummy worker who's faced with whether to relocate her company to, with her company to India and she decides to drive there from France. Uh, so it was a comedy and it was a road picture. And it uh, she comes across all these people on her way there and learns what kind of world she's coming into and being a part of. Anytime, uh, anyway, full time was uh, an overwhelmingly critical and audience acclaimed film and uh, earning Eric Ravel, many awards for his direction. It is, uh, to say the least, a master class in using cinematography, editing, and sound design to create a truly, a truly immersive experience. The film pulls no punches uh, in its portrayal uh, of the struggles of working mothers and uh, the anxieties of modern life uh, that affect them. Uh, it is it is a bravura performance on Laura Calamy. That's the name of the actress part. It all begins, the film all begins with sound. Uh, you hear her breathing. Uh, we don't see anything yet. And we realize she's, we begin to see her in close up that it's someone who's deep asleep. Uh, and this is Julie. This is Julie, our, our protagonist. And from the moment her alarm clock disturbs her sleeping breath, She's in a constant state of frantic motion. This, this film doesn't stop moving for a second. It is, it is total motion. Uh, and uh, she's frantic, waking her young daughter and son, making breakfast, tinkering with the boiler, dropping her kids off at uh, an elderly neighbor's house while it's still dark, uh, running, running and barely catching a train into Paris changing into a hotel maid's uniform, smoothing sheets, power hosing excrement from the walls, and battling her way back home to do it all over again. And that's just in the first, you know, 15 minutes of the film. I mean, this is, 
really, and the film is not that long to incorporate so much, uh, but Full Time depicts this never-ending sprint uh, that is Julie's life as a struggling single mother, rendering what is in truth a social realist drama. Uh, I mean, it couldn't be more resonant. Uh, it's a social realist drama as gritty, heart-pounding thriller. And this is one of the things that caught the critics' eyes, is the fact that he took something that could be a documentary, something that, that is, is so real in its approach, and turns it into a kind of thriller. Because we're sitting on the edge of our seat every minute watching her and where, where, when is she going to explode? When is she going to hit a wall? You know, when is everything going to go wrong? Uh, you know, you should you should excuse the expression, but you know, we see several times in this film, uh, the the shit hits the fan, uh, literally, literally, uh, and uh, it's you know all done with a naturalistic handheld camera, uh, the cinematography, and it's done well. It's adrenaline, the adrenaline pounds, uh, the electronic score. Uh, if you're listening to that score, it, it matches her emotions, her movements, and there's jump cut editing that only adds to all the tension. I mean, this this film is doesn't let up for a minute. Uh, yes, there are moments where it slows down a little bit, where you know a misplaced kiss, uh, you know, little things happen that are that can be a little bit humor. He releases the tension for a moment. But it's interesting in an imaginative approach when you think about it, how the director turns a very bad week, and that's all it is, is a bad week in the life of a single mother into an action thriller. And with it, uh, a bold socio-political statement, uh, simply by letting us watch Julie's life unfold or unravel, if you will, over the course of a week during transit strike that renders Julie's already challenging life nearly impossible. You know, uh, what can go wrong will go wrong. Uh, and it certainly does in this film. Every obstacle is thrown in her way. And, you know, when we first meet her, we have no idea. There's no real, the only backstory we have is that she's divorced, that her husband owes her alimony, he's unreachable, and, you know, she's hanging on by a thread. Uh, to, you know, she, she wants to, you know, where she lives so far away to get into Paris. You know, she lives in this small village outside of Paris. She has to take a train, a bus, and then the metro to get into work every day at this five-star hotel. So we see her working as, yes, she's a, a chambermaid, but she seems to be in charge of chambermaids. But we have no idea. Uh, of her education, her background. Uh, but when the system literally grinds to a halt, she never stops moving. She is jumping on to replacement buses. And I'm talking about the transportation, hitchhiking and taking off licensed cabs, or what we would call gypsy cabs, wherever she can just to get to work in the morning and return home to relieve her babysitter who is becoming excessively exasperated. She's an older woman. She doesn't really want to do this anymore. She has her own daughter to contend with. With calls to her ex-husband for not paying his alimony on time that goes straight to voicemail, and with the transit strike affecting her childcare issues, as well as problems with her supervisor at the hotel, Julie is a study in total desperation summoning whatever charm she can summon to first ask, then beg for favors. Uh, like turning it on to ask the doorman to help her with the taxis uh, or getting a trainee to clock out for her, uh, causing the trainee, who also has two kids to support, to lose her job. So we see you know, we're not just seeing Julie, we're seeing, you know, it's throwing a stone in the water and seeing it ripple, uh, this ripple effect that everybody, all the women we see in this film, how they're affected. And uh, it keeps us from never losing sight of how tenuous this life is. 
uh, the the young girl who gets fired. We, you know, everything hangs by these threads. But Julie is trying to reach for that light at the end of the tunnel, uh, a job interview at a market research company, which gives us an inkling of Julie's a lot better than we thought she was in terms of education. Uh, you know, she might be a lot more competent. I mean, she makes a decision. One of the inklings that we get is during the film when she makes the decision of how to clean up that bathroom. She musters everybody together. She gets them to do what's necessary. Uh, even though her supervisor gets mad at her for using the equipment, but she made a decision. Uh, so it gives us an inkling when we think back on it of who she is, uh, you know, and, and, and going for that job interview is the one thing keeping her moving forward constantly. She has a target. She has a goal, uh, like a shark. And despite being asked about why she was so critical, the company she's interviewing for, she handles herself professionally. If you remember, the interviewer talks to her and says, you really disparaged our company, and she handles it uh, very well. You know, there were competition, and she, she understood the situation. You know, full-time is a portrait. It is a portrait of just how challenging it is to escape poverty. And how easy it is to slip into, and how easy it is to slip into. Uh, Julie has experience in this corporate market research, but a company shut down, as we learn. She got divorced. She has two kids. Everything she does is for survival. And her life is held together with her sheer effort and the begrudging goodwill of those around her. Uh, the things about getting ahead is that it requires two things Julie lacks at the moment, time and money for last minute interviews, lunches, and new business suits, as we see. And we see how she you know, handles herself when, when things do go wrong. It's fascinating that the director chose to set this drama against the transit strike, serving to escalate all the obstacles Julie has to overcome. You know, he just figures out what can I throw in front of her, uh, and it serves. You know, it, it it it's so relevant. The film becomes relevant that we see her as a worker who can't just work from home due to a transit worker striking in opposition to an increase in hours to support the welfare program, and here is a woman who doesn't want to go on welfare. Uh, you know, she wants to work. Because like all great socio-political dramas, great neo-realism neo from Italy, work is a driving force. Work is dignity. Uh, working is, work is being able to hold your head up high, uh, especially for your children. Uh, despite any solidarity she might feel uh, with her coworkers and, and with the striking workers, she has no choice but to battle through to continue earning her paycheck to continue striving for more. The only solidarity Julie has to keep is to keep her family afloat, sparing her only ragged scraps of energy for herself and her kids. I mean, I love it when they take a bath together. All of these little moments are so real. They just, they just you know, make it so human for us. Uh, you know, she she uh, you know, she showers her kids with love in what little moments she can, even going to almost superhuman lengths to give her little boy a great birthday party. I mean, that's another one. I mean, again, she's thinking, how do I get this thing? How do I get it home? You know, and she's putting it together. I mean, all of these things she does, you know, she is super mom. Uh, and with no time to be anything other than a mother or a hotel maid, she has little opportunity to just be herself. She has to be coer coerced into have, you know, sharing a drink with her best friend who barely recognizes her anymore. Uh, and in one quiet moment with that neighbor who is her son's friend's father, she makes a faux pas uh, that fortunately he manages to politely exit from. Uh, again, it's a human moment. You know, he they they do like each other, but he's, you know, whoa, don't get the wrong idea. And he's he's really a nice guy. 
finally being locked out of her job uh, at that point and learning that she may not have gotten the job she was up for, she decides to take the kids to the amusement park. You know, when she's given the, you know, she's she's told, oh, no, we we already have somebody and, and uh, she's just like, she's distraught. She decides to take the kids to the amusement park. And while standing alone on that platform, I mean, that is a crucial moment in the film, probably the most dramatic moment in the film. We, we, and that's again, sound and editing. The train is coming, she's standing on the platform and what we're thinking is probably what she's thinking. Uh, yet, you know, we hear the thunder of the train wheels approaching, giving the subtlest of hints of a possible way out of an unendurable grind. We realize just how invested we've become We've become in her trying to succeed against what looks like insurmountable odds. And we don't want her to do what we think she might do. And, uh, you know, it's not her nature. She's not going to give up. And after watching her claw and fight and dodge every obstacle in her way to pull her under, it's that moment of surrender that salvation comes. And along with it, the hope that keeps her going and going and going. At the center of this tornado is the astounding Laura Colony, who some of you may know for her role in the Netflix comedy, Call My Agent. If, you've been, if you're familiar with that comedy, you would be familiar with Laura. She had a very funny role in it and uh, she was a standout. Though she is known for her comedic work, uh, this darker role and performance for which she won the 2021 Best Actress Prize at the Venice Film Festival. Uh, she won several other awards around the world, as a matter of fact, uh, was decidedly a bravura change uh, for her on screen. And while she is required to constantly shapeshift running from role to role, mother to maid to marketing exec, she delivers a performance that is utterly present at every moment, utterly present physically and emotionally uh, in the adrenaline-fueled panic of a world in which her character exists and finally overcoming the odds, finally overcoming the odds. I mean, we have to root for her and, you know, we're sitting there saying, oh, I hope this doesn't end badly, especially when she's on the train track, on the train station platform, you know, we're going, what is Shelley doing to us? What is he going, what is he doing to us with this film? Where is he taking us? It's interesting to note that, that Laura Callum herself and the other actresses all went through maid service training to prepare for their roles. Uh, they spent actually six weeks working in the in a high class hotel to really adapt to these roles. Uh, Calamy underwent herself a one day crash course at the Bristol Five Star Luxury Hotel in Paris to understand the gestures and postures specific to the profession. Through a close friend, she was given the opportunity to communicate with exploited chambermaids, uh, with immigrant chambermaids and exploited chambermaids before filming. And though they were on strike at the time, they was, there was a strike, she was able to question them regarding their physical health concerns, the hellish pace of their work and aspects of their professional lives person of their personal lives. So she really dug into this role and it shows on screen. If you were to watch this, you know, without knowing anything else, you would believe it. You know, you would you would say they must have gotten a real person to play this part, uh, that even the chambermaids uh, are, are real chambermaids. They're not actresses, yet they were. I mean, this was, it, it is an extraordinary film. Uh, and deservedly, you know, won its awards deservedly. So uh, I think, you know, it, it really resonates is, as Marilyn said at the beginning, this is a universal film. There's no question about it. Wherever you would show this film, women, even men can relate to this situation. 
I mean, it, it's it's a throwback in many ways to, as I said, neorealism, uh, to uh, all films we know about people who are constantly in search of work. Uh, it has a documentary style, but, and, and, you know, I will tell you, there was a quote years ago uh, from uh, one of the world's great directors, Jean-Luc Godard, who said the highest compliment you can pay a fictional film is that it looks like a documentary and vice versa. The highest praise you can praise, uh, give a documentary is that it looks like a fictional film because it looks unbelievable. But yet that is high praise. And this is the kind of praise this film got and deserves. Uh, so I hope you all uh, went along with it. You, uh, you know, went through this roller coaster and came out the other side knowing that there were good things going to happen uh, to our character. So now I'd like to open it up to you and get your thoughts and your feelings on it. Uh, I see so many, so many people not on screen. I have a feeling they're looking at another screen uh, while, <laughs> while we're discussing the film because I know what's going on over there. Uh, but I will get back to that after we finish tonight. So, uh, Dora, thank you. Jump right in there. <laughs> okay. Um, what really got me is that she's always moving, moving, and she has all these things that would anybody would just start, you know, stop and cry or get really angry. But she had she was calm with the kids, especially, you know, kids are uh, jumping and doing all this. And when the kid gets, uh, uh, he jumps in. And, and when she gets the, for, for the birthday, I mean, she has scared, she has very little money, but she still goes and buys a trampoline and, and has the birthday. And she's always like happy, not happy, but at least she doesn't until the very, very end. And I think it's like she was holding it all. And in, at the end, she explodes and cries yeah. when when this good news is given to her. So I thought that, that was a great thing. It, it's a great movie, and especially how she jumped, uh, how he was the director, of course. I mean, that, that she uh, rented a van then she jumped into the taxi and then and, and and then when she comes to the hotel after going through everything and even even running and then she finds out that they don't let her in and i think that there would be a moment of despair and she would like cry or something but she doesn't she's very mm -hmm. resilient very so yes. i like that very much yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank you. Marilyn? Um, I thought that I really enjoyed the movie. I thought it was very true to life. And one of the things that, that got to me was you talked about her education. She seemed to be a victim of feminism that she married, and yet she had to give up whatever her career was to raise the children and put that on hold because obviously there was something she wasn't a trained maid she was trained to do something which obviously came back and hopefully that will sustain her but it was very universal also in that many of us can relate to you know having an education giving it up having your children some got divorced, some didn't get divorced, but it all falls back to the same thing. Your children, you know, are are affected by all of this, but of course the woman herself is too. Absolutely. I mean, I and you know, she was basically, you know, becomes a victim of globalization, you know, and now, you know, and forced out and and having to work her way back in. And it takes perseverance. Uh, we all, you know, many of us have come across these points in our lives where uh, you figure, OK, you know, they want us to fold the cards, but you don't. You don't. You go on. Uh, you have to have patience, resilience, you know, and, and do what's necessary, especially, 
you know, that she had the kids. Her husband obviously left her for whatever reason. And, you know, she was forced to live in a small village uh, far away from the city, which she was really uh, where she had probably been working before. And then she was probably willing to take it. That was all she could afford. Yeah. I mean, and she was, lived yes. up here because it's a lot less expensive. Yes, that too. You know, and depending on others, you know, like the woman to take care of the kids uh, before they can go to school. Uh, it, it is, you know, we can all relate to these difficulties. You know, we've seen them all before, but this film doesn't let up for a moment, you know, and, until the end. I mean, it has the small little breaks in it, mm -hmm. but then it, 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 really, it really delivers a punch. Uh, so thank you. Uh, Rachel? I also felt like it was almost like a documentary and I felt the adrenaline rush of like, I'm with her. I'm going on that train. I, I felt it. I felt her character and it, it, with the music playing and her just scrambling, 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 I felt for her. And also I liked it that she wasn't a perfect character. She was asking people to lie for her. She was asking, you know, and and it cost her her job, you know, the uh, the trainee. Mm -hmm. And also, I thought it was also I loved the fact that when she was sleeping, there was the underwater scene, like she's above, you know, like she's drowning in, in in everything, <laughs> <laughs> and. It was a reoccurring dream to her. And I also like the fact that they didn't, um, with the kiss that she gave, if it was done in America, it would be a rom-com and then they would fall in love or something right. like that. And it was just a moment in time that she just kissed him and it was just weird and it was great. So I, I, I just thought it was just... Uh, and I, it reminded me of, in a way, the American um, uh, series called May, Made, Made, you know, where, Made. yes, oh, yeah. and she's ha going through the struggles and things like that. So, but I, I really, and the one thing that I did think about, which at the end of the movie, when she does get the job, I'm also concerned because she's going to go through the same thing. She has more money now. But now she has to do the same thing. They asked her if she's good, can't work long hours. Mm -hmm. So she's going to need somebody to take care of her kids. So while it's a better position, she still might have some of the same struggles. Yeah, she would. But, you know, uh, and if she's she's as competent as we want her to be uh, and hope she is and see how she how competently she did handle certain things during uh, the film, during that week, uh, you know, she wants to move closer to Paris. She will hopefully and and be able to, you know, give the kids the things they need and be able to, you know, eventually move up in that organization. So that's what we hope for, you know, that somebody can arrive at that at that point. Uh, and we watch her get up that rung. So if she can go, she can get to the next rung. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's what we hope for. Uh, thank you, Rachel Allette. Well, I think everybody said it all. I can only say to you, I was so <laughs> exhausted. <laughs> Watching that movie, I was really exhausted. But it just shows you that out of bad comes good. It was a bad situation that she ended up with, but she got all this inner strength for her children. Mm -hmm. they, they were her priority. And oh, my heart dropped when the elderly nanny mentioned her daughter may be calling welfare. Mm -hmm. And that really just grabbed me. And I said, oh, my God, she would go to the ends of the earth to avoid that, knowing that the children <laughs> may be taken away and what have you. But you know what? The love that she had for those children, as exhausted as she was in the bathtub, and the little boy had the nightmare, they came first. Yes. Her children always came first. Yes. And she did she... not let anything stand in her way. I mean, just to think of everything she went through, just just with the, the buses and the trains, you, you say to yourself, could I have done that? 
you know? She was just so strong and so pivoted to accomplish something. What I really liked was when she called about the job because she hadn't heard from mm -hmm. the company and she did go after that. That yeah. takes a lot of guts <laughs> to go ahead and she just stayed on that phone and then realized, okay, she got the information, goodbye. I was very proud of her for doing that. And I <laughs> cried with her at the end. I felt <laughs> the happiness that she felt after everything that she put into effort to get it. So thanks for uh, recommending it to us. Truly enjoyed it. A pleasure. And, and, you know, it is some of the smaller details in the film, you know, that, that you, you could recall when she goes and she changes in the, in the women's room, in the bathroom mm -hmm. and where she puts her clothes, you know, <laughs> figuring out ah, nobody's going to go in there so she can get them out later. Uh, you know, all these little human things, you know, that she's, she's thinking every minute, you know, how to handle the situation it was terrific. Thank you, all that. Uh, Marilyn, did you have something else? Um, you know, as I was thinking about the character and the actions of, of Julie, I think ultimately having a parent like her will be something that will serve us as a great role model to her children. Mm -hmm. And hopefully having a parent like that who was a survivor I mean, she was flawed as well. She wasn't. Yes. She's human. Yeah. yeah. She's human. When she's cut, she bleeds. She <laughs> yeah, exactly. Same. However, I think that her children, when they look back and if she continues along the path of doing what was good for her and, and, but she, they definitely felt that they were her priority in addition. Mm -hmm. So I think ultimately she will have been a great role model. Or somebody you know, having a parent like her um, is a good role model to children. Which yeah, I mean, you know, we you look. You don't at, get all. You don't get a lot of that. Yeah, you know, we we do see her flaws. We see, but they're they're flaws that are human. I mean, you know, when she does what she does, she has to survive, and she has to, you know, she takes the risks, and and uh, you know, unfortunately, other people get affected by it. Uh, so, you know, and, and that's really, that's life. That's life. How many times we've seen that happen to people. Uh, so I, it's understandable, you know, you may not appreciate it all the time, but it, it does happen. And it's, uh, you know, it's her only way. I mean, she's dealing with this, you know, when he throws in this transit strike, that really is, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a city that's standing mm -hmm. still, yet yep. she's still moving. <laughs> is what's interesting. Anybody else? Anybody else out there have something they want to add? Or is everybody anxious to get to this uh, oh, press wait. conference? Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> at, one thing, Shelly. Yeah. At, at the birthday party, the young man that brought his son, yeah. and when, when he offered to help her, you notice she didn't want to bother him. It's okay. You know, there's no need for that. So mm -hmm. she really wants to stand on her own two feet. Yeah. So that shows you again, the resilience <laughs> and the strength. Yeah. And, and but I, I love the fact, you know, what Rachel said, you know, if this were, you know, if this were a Hollywood movie, it would be a rom-com mm -hmm. because, <laughs> you know, they would have kissed and next thing you know, they're moving in together. <laughs> uh, you know, we're putting two <laughs> families together. Uh, but we know True. he's probably got a wife back there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't work like that. You know, it, it, it hits the reality of the situation. And also, you know, I think she she's feeling needy uh, in a certain way, in a romantic way, if you will. You know, and she's she just feels, you know, this is this is a natural need as well. And I think we, you know, we get to see that side of her. Uh, so I, I, you know, everything is considered uh, in making her human and uh, making her real, so to speak. Uh, which well, that I one minute action spoke thousands of words. Like oh, absolutely. You said. Absolutely. <laughs> she, she needed, she needed that contact. Yeah. Yeah. That she need. Did. She did. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Karen. Karen, yep. Uh, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed the uh, movie too. Um, and um, I guess it makes me think of my granddaughter. 
and all she goes through. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, why isn't she calling me? Why doesn't she answer my texts? You know, and then it's like, you know, if you knew what all she has to go through. And I mean, she's not divorced, but she has it's still a very hectic life for for her family. Oh, sure. So anyway, yeah, I just I did lower it. I did um, enjoy the movie very much, though. That's a that's a great comment because you know we we have to think about you know in this day and age especially with what's been happening in the last few years how many kids came out of college and were faced with not being able to enter the career that they thought they would uh, and are working in other jobs you know and how much they will have to do to hopefully work their way towards their goals. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I have a daughter who at one point was working, you know, was hoping and she went to work, you know, in, in sales in a, in a store, retail sales uh, for a year uh, mm -hmm. and then managed to get back in. I mean, it's just it's it takes perseverance. It takes time. Uh, sure. It involves everything. So I, I thought that I thought the film really shows us that uh, yes. in many ways that people can relate to. And I think they did. I think people really related to this film. Uh, anybody else? Anybody else with something to say? Nobody? Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, I think you're all anxious to get out of here. <laughs> Which, okay, well, next, next film up uh, is an equally interesting film on a different level. Uh, it is called Things to Come. And it stars a very great actress, Isabel Huppert. Uh, it's, uh, she portrays, and, and it, it is another star turn for her in a very interesting role. Uh, she plays a character named Natalie, who is a philosophy teacher uh, in Paris. Uh, she's passionate about her work and passing on uh, the pleasure of that thinking of who she is, her passion comes through to her students. Uh, she's married with two, two uh, grown children. Uh, she divides her time, you know, between her, her work and her family, a former students, and her very possessive mother. Uh, however, one day, her world is shaken naturally with the prospect of having to reinvent herself. And uh, we will see how she handles the situation mm -hmm. and and uh, how she gets out of this one. So I think, you know, it will prove uh, this now takes, you know, a, an older woman uh, in the throes of being faced uh, with things on the job uh, or in her profession as well. Uh, but in, in trying to come into a new world at her age. So... I will look forward to hearing you talk about that film uh, mm -hmm. in two weeks. In two weeks. Yep. Can't so, wait. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank yes. you. Shelly. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Be, right, well. be well. Thank you, Shelly. Be well. Thank you. And see Thank you all in two weeks. Yes. I'll look forward <laughs> okay. to seeing faces instead of names. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Boy, I thought I thought I thought I was on, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna stop the. Okay. Okay.